preparation, preparation, preparation. It's the secret of success in so many areas of life. Decorating a room, it's vital, isn't it, to strip off all those old layers of wallpaper before you apply new wallpaper. Or if you're painting, to ensure that you wash the walls down well before you paint them. We once moved into a house which had clearly been decorated in the 1970s because one room had lime green paint and another room had day glow orange. So when we first moved in, we simply had to do something about those. Preparation is the secret to competing in sport too. If you don't train, you won't be fit enough for what you're going to compete in. And if you don't practice, your skills won't be sufficiently automatic to be ready when you need them. The South African golfer Gary Player used to say to people who said, oh, you were lucky with shots that he played, he said it was remarkable. The more he practised, the luckier he got. Now, in this little section of Mark's Gospel that we've read, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15, we're seeing the key preparations for Jesus' ministry. We're seeing his baptism by John, the vision he sees and the voice he hears, his time in the wilderness, and then he walks onto the public stage in verses 14 and 15 and announces his mission. And the focus throughout is on Jesus. Remember how Mark begins his gospel in chapter 1 verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark's book is a book about Jesus. In ancient terms, it's like an ancient biography, where the focus is really on the person it's about. So as we look at this, we're going to say, what's Mark saying to us about Jesus through this, these sections? His baptism in verse 9 is covered very, very briefly, because it isn't the focus of what Mark has to say. The heart of this experience is in the account of the, the vision and the voice in the next couple of verses, in verses 10 and 11. But Jesus in being baptised is clearly not um, repenting of his sins and seeking forgiveness, which is what John's baptism is about, because he doesn't need to. But he is saying, I stand with John. John is my genuine predecessor. He's the one who prepares the way for me. He's the one who announces me. And he's the one who has done the right job in preparing my way. But then look at verses 10 and 11. Because you've got two things going on. You've got a vision and a voice. And the two interpret each other. Let's look at them in turn. Start with the vision. Mark uses a really striking phrase in verse 10 that Jesus saw the heavens torn apart. It really is a striking phrase, isn't it? And it's, it's standard language in the Bible for a vision given from heaven. Think of the way the book of Revelation a number of times says, I saw heaven open. And then John in Revelation has this mind-boggling vision. That's what's happening to Jesus. Jesus is seeing a vision. And as far as we can see, it's just Jesus. In verse 10, it says, he saw the heavens torn apart. So there's no suggestion that other people see this. It's a private experience for Jesus. Perhaps John the Baptist saw it too. John's Gospel hints at that. But Jesus' vision is the crucial thing. Then you get the voice. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I'm well pleased. The voice is quoting scripture. And there are two key biblical echoes in what the voice says. Yes, God quotes from the Bible. And it's worth noticing this, that when you see a little snippet of scripture cited, it's worth looking at the setting it comes from in the Old Testament, since it's likely 
but the snippet is there as a marker to say to you, look at the whole story, the whole passage in the Old Testament. You are my son is from Psalm 2 verse 7. Psalm 2 is a royal psalm, it's a coronation psalm for the day of coronation of a king or perhaps for a celebration of a coronation later. And the king, of course, is God's anointed. That's how you become king. You're anointed by one of the prophets. You have oil poured or smeared on you. And for Christians, that word anointed has a particular sense because that's the word from which we get our word Christ or Messiah. Jesus is being marked by the voice that says, you are my son as the anointed king of Israel. He is God's son, just as the king of Israel was God's son. Remember chapter 1 verse 1 again, Jesus Christ, the son of God. We hear about Jesus as God's son at a couple of other places in Mark's Gospel. And the one to notice here is the one where you also get the verb for tearing. It happens when Jesus is dying on the cross. In chapter 15, verses 38 and 39, the curtain of the temple is torn, same word as here, um, as Jesus dies. And it's a literal tearing, which is to say that God is no longer confined to the temple. He's out in the world seeking and finding people. And what happens immediately after that? Well, there's the voice of the centurion at the foot of the cross in 1539 saying, surely this man was the son of God. So we've got tearing and the Son of God, like a pair of bookends at the beginning and end of Mark's Gospel. This is a key thing Mark has to say to us. This is a key point he's making. J Jesus is truly God's Son, God's anointed King. The other echo in this verse is with you, I'm well pleased. Now that echoes Isaiah 42 verse 1. My chosen one in whom my soul delights. Very similar phrasing. That section of Isaiah is about God's choice of a servant who will be his herald. Who, a servant who will announce what God is doing to the people of Israel who at that time are in exile in Babylon. Now that's the role Jesus now has. Jesus is now the servant of God, who's going to serve God, even going as far as walking to the cross and suffering for God's people. And he's God's servant herald, announcing God's call to the people out of the exile of sin. They're not in exile in Babylon like Isaiah's time. They're in exile in sin and, and lost from God. So the combination of these two Old Testament passages points to Jesus as God's anointed king, God's Messiah who's come to rule, and as God's servant herald who's announcing what God is now doing and will do. And we'll see more of that in verses 14 and 15. We hear the voice again at the Transfiguration in chapter 9, verse 7. But this time, it's not just Jesus who hears the voice. The three disciples who are with him, Peter, James and John, hear the voice saying, This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. Again, the heavenly voice is quoting Psalm 2, verse 7. This is my son. To assure the disciples that Jesus is right at the centre of God's plan to save Israel and the world as God's anointed king. And the Spirit comes upon Jesus. He sees the Spirit descending like a dove on him. 
the the spirit equips and empowers Jesus for this double task as God's king and God's servant herald. Just notice how the three persons of the Godhead are involved in this moment. There's the Son, seeing the Spirit coming upon him and hearing the voice of the Father. The triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, is utterly committed and utterly involved in the mission of Jesus. There's no question of leaving Jesus to get on with it alone. 